Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. After su such a lovely introduction, the most sensible thing for me would be to drop dead because there's no way I can ful fulfil uh, the expectations that Valerie has kindly raised in your minds. Um, you are time-torn creatures. You are transients like me. And as a transient, I want to tell you what a privilege I feel that I'm giving one of the Gresham College lectures. I'm going to say one or two things this evening about the nature of time. More precisely, I'm going to talk about some themes in a particular book on time, of time and lamentation, Reflections on Transience, whose handsome cover you can see on the slide. More precisely still, I'm going to discuss just a few themes in the book. I want to say something about the genesis of my preoccupation with time and the wider background of ideas behind it. It goes back a long way to my school days when I was both irritated and intrigued by the conversations of those of my fellows who had televisions. Alas, our family couldn't afford a television, and there was much talk at school of Herman Bondy's famous series of popularising lectures, E equals MC squared. These were on cosmology, on general relativity, and time travel, and so on. Behind them was the assumption that physics had the last word on time, however counterintuitive and paradoxical its conclusions. If you want to know the time, ask a policeman, as the song went. But if you want to know what time was, you ask a physicist. And I knew this wasn't right, but I couldn't say in what respect. Now, when I started writing philosophy seriously, I focused on the philosophy of language, of mind and consciousness. I also devoted or wasted a decade or two on combating various philosophical illnesses, such as neuromania, the idea that you are your brain, and Darwinitis, the notion that human beings are essentially evolved organisms and that persons are to be understood in biological terms. Towards the end of the 90s, the 1990s by the way, not the 1890s, it became apparent to me that what I was most opposed to was naturalism. The idea that humans are essentially pieces of nature and both subject to and explained by the laws of nature and that the way forward for human self-understanding was to see ourselves through the lens of the natural sciences. This was seen mistakenly, in my view, as liberating, because it was thought to be the only alternative to supernaturalism, to an, uh, to an essentially religious account of the origin of humankind, of our nature, and of our place in the scheme of things. It seemed to me that there was a task for humanism, and I am a secular humanist, and more generally secular thought, develop an image of ourselves that was in thrall neither to theological stories nor to scientism, to the idea that natural science has the last word on what we are. And I pursued this goal primarily by means of philosophically informed descriptions and meditations on items such as the human head, the hand, the metamorphoses of hunger in our lives, gestures such as pointing, and our lives seen through the rear mirror of death from the standpoint of our corpse. But these are only indirect ways of reminding ourselves how our ordinary daily life was utterly different from that of the material world, or indeed of our nearest primate kin. It was a celebration of what Karl Marx in his early writings, before alas he discovered communism, what Karl Marx spoke of as our species being. Now, the main target hitherto of my anti-scientism, not to be confused with being anti-science, which would be absurd, was the misuse of biological science to create a distorted and impoverished image of ourselves. But I was conscious that behind biology there lay a bigger beast, physics. Physics is, of course, wonderful. It can lay claim to be our greatest cognitive achievement. And the wall-to-wall -wall landscape of artefacts that makes our lives safer longer, more comfortable, and indeed more fun, should command our gratitude as well as our awe. But the increasingly loud claim that we're heading towards a theory that explains everything in the universe, including ourselves, is worrying. The view that physics was going to provide the final answers has been expressed most clearly by the Nobel Prize winner, Stephen Weinberg. The explanatory arrow, he says, points downwards from societies to people to organs, to cells, to biochemistry, to chemistry, and ultimately to physics. 
Societies are explained by people, people by organs, organs by cells, cells by biochemistry, biochemistry by chemistry, and chemistry by physics. Now, the consequences of believing this were also set out by Weinberg. The more we know of the universe, the more meaningless it appears. This is, of course, unappealing, but more interestingly, I believe it's untrue. And for this reason, I redirected my attention from scientism to a mode of scientism that draws its, from biologism to a mode of scientism that draws its authority from physics. In particular, I focused on the physics of something central to human life, namely time. And so we arrive back at Of Time and Lamentation. The book is in three parts. Part one is killing time, part two, human time, and part three is finding time. In the first part, killing time, I examine what physics does to time and lead to our understanding of the nature of the world. And I focus in particular on the reduction of time in physics to something called little t. Little t is a pure quantity, and it's one of four dimensions, the others being the three dimensions of space. The discussion of time as little t, which should be seen for what it is, namely a mathematical abstraction, this discussion is a jumping-off point for a wider investigation of what I see as the exsanguination of the world in scientism that sees the sum total of things as a system of magnitudes. Such a system has no place for actual experiences, values, meaning or purpose. It not only excludes humanity from something central to our lives, mainly time, but it also empties space. It reduces places to decimal places. And finally, in this particular section of the book, I discuss the relationship between mathematics and reality, a hotly contested topic and something which could be the theme of a whole talk. But in passing, I deal with tasty questions, such as how we come to think of time as a space-like fourth dimension. Is there a thing, such as the passage or flow of time? Does time have a direction? Is there an arrow of time? Is time travel possible? Are the paradoxes of relativity theory real? And what is meant when we say that clocks tell the time? My treatment on, of clocks addresses the question of how we know one clock is more accurate than another. Where does that clock get its authority from? The answer is less obvious and more interesting than the question might suggest. The authority of two clocks has two main sources. Firstly, there is the level of synchrony between different types of clocks. Atomic clocks remain in more precise synchrony than pendulum clocks. But secondly and more importantly, the discovery of laws enables periodicities to be predicted independently of direct measurement. The relevant laws themselves have a predictive precision that goes beyond any actual measurement. For example, the law of gravity was verified to an accuracy of 4% by Newton, but it's recently been verified to be accurate to within 1 over 10,000%. Time measures are embedded in and hence validated by fundamental laws of mechanics. So that's why comparing clocks is not like buying two copies of The Guardian to see whether the news is true. What, however, it does underline is that time in physics is time reduced to pure quantity. Time as little t as a number of units, as part of a world reduced to a system of magnitudes. And I'll return to this. In the second part of the book, human time enters, becomes centre stage. At the heart of human time is something that physics cannot accommodate. Tensed time. The difference between the past, the present and the future. Einstein, here not played by Geoffrey Rush, famously argued that tensed time, the time of past, present and future, was not real so far as a physicist was concerned. He even wrote to this effect to the widow of his oldest friend, Michele Besso, to cheer her up. Now Besso has departed from this strange world a little ahead of me. That means nothing. People like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between past, present and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. In short, 
Cheer up, ducky. But later in his life, he admitted that this worried him, as reported by the great philosopher Rudolf Carnap. Once, Einstein said to me that the problem of now, of now, worried him. He explained that the experience of now means something special for man, you bet, something essentially different from the past and the future, but that this difference does not and cannot occur within physics, because the present isn't a privileged viewpoint within physics. That this experience cannot be grasped by science seemed to him a matter for painful but inevitable resignation. But he could have been spared this worry had he just accepted that there are aspects of time, fundamental aspects of time, that simply lie beyond the reach of science, and indeed are irrelevant to what science is concerned about, though they are central to our human experience of time. In short, if he'd appreciate that physics doesn't have the last word on time, though it has many important and useful things to say about quantities of time. And so after a defence of the reality of tense time, against most physicists, and also to their undying shame, quite a few philosophers, I examine each of the tenses. I begin with the present tense, which proves to be immensely rich, but it's also paradoxical. It is at once elusive and inescapable. You can't get hold of the present, and you can't escape from it either. Its elusiveness was highlighted by St. Augustine. The present is a point of time so small that it cannot be divided into even most minute particles and moments. Such a time must fly so rapidly that it has no duration and no extension. And this is a mistake shared by many physicists. The notion that the essence of time is that it's made up of extensionless instants or moments. But those extensionless instants and moments are simply logical constructs, mathematical constructs. In the book, there's a long and I hope enjoyable discussion of now of the present teeming moment that escaped Einstein and indeed St. Augustine. The present has depths and widths and multiplicities that have nothing to do with the durationless temporal points or instances of little time to which physics reduces time and Augustine reduces the present. Exploring the nature of now offers a wonderful way of illuminating the teeming complexity of our supposedly ordinary consciousness. No wonder Piglet told Pooh that today was his favourite day. Hear, hear, Winnie. And so to the past. My exploration of the past starts off with a wonderfully poignant line from the late medieval French poet François Villon, Ballade de Dame du Temps Jadis, when he wonders what happened to the ladies of negotiable, negotiable affections, sex workers, I think we call them nowadays, with whom he spent much of his misspent youth. Mais où sont les neiges d'antan? Where are the snows of yesterday? Yesterday. The past is deeply mysterious because it is the present of that which, by definition, is no longer present. It also has many layers, from the earlier stage of a process that's still going on, like the present talk, to the past of yesterday, of our childhood, of historical time, and of geological and astronomical time. So there are different pasts of immediate recall, of distant memory, of facts, private, public, and historical facts. None of those, of course, are picked up by physics. The primary curator of the fact, of the past, human memory, and indeed the documents that curate our memories, proves to be entirely mysterious, and none of the existing models offered by neuroscientists does anything to diminish or even address its its mystery. I want to introduce to the concept of the double intentionality or aboutness of memory. Memories are about or of experiences that themselves are of or about events in the states of the world. Nothing of that can be captured by neural discharges in the brain, by basically ions passing through semi-permeable membranes in the walls of neurons. This is also an opportunity to combat presentism a view held by many philosophers that only what is present exists or is real 
and that the past and the future and past and future entities are not real. Presentism is a perfectly harmless ism. No one was murdered in its name. But it produces all sorts of unnecessary difficulties. The difficulty, for example, when we try to explain if the past is unreal, why some statements about the past are true, such as Socrates was a Greek, and other statements of the past are not true, such as Socrates was Welsh. If there's nothing corresponding to Socrates, how can we say Socrates is Greek and not Welsh? Well, the presence of the past lies in its consequences, including records of those consequences. They are traced to their origin in the past by human consciousness, human consciousness that physics cannot accommodate. And it's by this means the past is resurrected, real and present. No such resurrection is possible in the physical world. The physical world at a particular time is the sum total of the physical world at that time. There is no basis for digging up the past and making it live. Its effects are simply there in the present. Only in humans are those long-completed causes also presented as objects of memory and of record. And what about the future? Among the questions that are particularly interesting about the future, two are paramount. The first is, how can tomorrow be present today? Or in what sense is the future real? Of course, it's there in terms of possibilities that are entertained. The second question is one that's exercised philosophers since the ancient Greeks, whether what is going to happen in the future is predetermined, already fixed. There are familiar fatalistic arguments arising out of the fact, or seeming fact, that the laws of nature are by definition unbreakable. Everything according to physics must surely unfold along the tram lines those laws set down. But at the heart of our freedom is something physics cannot understand, the capacity to turn time back to front. We turn time round on itself. We reach for causes to bring about effects. The present is shaped by possibilities today, which we envisage happening tomorrow. We make this envisaged future tomorrow drive the present. At the heart of our freedom is the ability to envisage possibility. And possibilities lie outside the scope of physics, which of course, appropriately, only describes actuality. Our freedom lies in our ability to stand out of, ti- out of the time at which our material bodies are located. We project ourselves into an explicit future, one that may be individual or shared, that draws on an equally explicit pl- past, which likewise might be individual or shared. It is this tensed time that we have which accounts for our otherwise inexplicable capacity to act freely and to be truly the origin of at least some of our actions, and hence responsible for them. The world, according to physics, has no space for past and future, or indeed for the present, so it cannot explain, and indeed seems to disprove our freedom. But as Einstein admitted, this is not a proof that we're not free, but that physics is incomplete as an account of what there is. The other form of fatalism was originally suggested by Aristotle when he argued as follows. Either a sea battle will take place tomorrow or it will not take place tomorrow. One of these must be true. If one of them is true, then it must be true today. So whether there is or is not a sea battle is foreordained. There's clearly something wrong with the argument, but tracking it down takes us to all sorts of places and there are fiendishly complicated and indeed delicious arguments to be had on the way. One, perhaps, for our discussion. In the book, the fourth and final stop in the second part is eternity, which proves, even to a secular humanist such as myself, an extraordinarily rich idea. Indeed, eternity is possibly the most profound idea the humanity has ever had, with the exception of the idea of God, who is, of course, eternity's star inhabitant. And I speak as a secular humanist. So in part one, I rescued 
time from the jaws of physics in part two restored human right human time to its rightful that is to say its central place in the third part finding time i then address the question of what is time examine the relationship between time and causation causation which has been called the cement of the universe and finally demonstrate the connection between time in particular tense time and human freedom which i've already talked about in what is time, I endeavour to clarify the nature of the beast, though I suffer an honourable failure to arrive at a non-circular definition, as I will explore with you shortly. I also investigate the stuff of time, moments and instants. I look at the relationship between time and change, and examine whether there can be change without time, or time without change, something for discussion perhaps. And I oversee a battle royal between those who say that human time is primary, and others who hand the palm to clock or astronomical time? The answer to the question is extraordinarily complicated and best represented by this figure, the Ouroboros that swallows itself. Human time encompasses astronomical time, and astronomical time identifies human time as just a late event in the history of time. There is much to be said about the relationship between time, causation, and human freedom. In the first part of the book, I dismiss the idea that time has a direction, that there is an arrow of time. The most commonly cited support, source of the supposed directionality of time, at least among philosophers, is the relationship between cause and effect. Causes, they say, must occur before their effects, and this ordering forms the basis of the arrow of time. And it's this that underpins the difference between before and after. The idea of cause, however, proves to be very elusive. And it is, I hunt it down over many pages and then eventually feed it to the hounds. And in fact, the very notion of a cause has undergone a certain amount of battering, even within science itself. Well, that's a gallop through some of the territory covered in Of Time and Lamentation. But I want to pick up one or two themes of the book with you. And they are, what is time? Time is the fourth dimension, the seductive myth of time travel, and then the idea of the flow of time. So let's begin rather late at the beginning. What is time? We recognise that time is intrinsically complex. There is temporal location. When did such and such an event happen? Temporal order. In what order did events take place? And temporal duration, how long did such and such an event take? And then, as I've already emphasised, there is tense time, past, present and future. So how should we define time? Here's a few goes. Time is our perception of the sequence of events. Well, this doesn't work. The sequence of events implies temporal sequence of events. So the definition boils down to Time is our perception of time, or our perception of temporal order. And that doesn't seem to get us very far. Worse still, it is deeply contentious, because it implies there would be no time in the absence of a perception of the sequence of events. From this, we would conclude that there is no time prior to the emergence of conscious beings. But we know that conscious beings are rather latecomers in the history of the universe. Prior to conscious beings, there was the Big Bang the formation of the planets, including the Earth, the emergence of life, and finally the development of conscious life. This is not merely a speculative empirical order of events. It's logically necessary that the Big Bang should occur before the emergence of conscious life. So let's try something else. Time is what stops everything happening at once. This is perhaps a jokey definition, but it's also circular. At once means at the same time. So we have time is what stops happening, everything happening at the same time. Another but less jokey definition is time allows change without contradiction. If I say that Raymond Tallis is in Stockport and Raymond Tallis is in London, that seems like a contradiction. Unless I add that Raymond Tallis is in Stockport at one time and London at another. This makes time permissive of change. But there are problems with this. The most important is that the permissiveness of time 
is dangerously close to the notion that time itself has causal powers. Indeed, many philosophers argued in favour of this idea that time is defined by the direction of causation. The eminent philosopher of time, Hugh Miller, for example, has stated that time is the causal dimension of space-time. But there are many reasons for rejecting this idea. The most important is, if time were a cause in its own right, every change would have two causes, time plus the preceding event that brought it about, the cause in the usual sense. What's more, time being homogeneous would not favour one event rather than another, and hence could not have a part to play in the occurrence of one particular event in directing the unfolding of things. What's more, causes must always precede their effects, so we must assume that time is in place before we can have causal sequences. So let's try again. Another slightly jokey definition is time is what happens when nothing else does. It's what's left when events are drained from the world. This is wrong because it assumes that time can be separated from change, that it is itself a kind of stuff, and that, worst of all, that it is a kind of happening or process. Sixth definition. Time is the direction of becoming of the overall changes in the universe. There have been numerous attempts to equate time with certain universal characteristics evident in the way the world unfolds. These are the so-called arrows of time. It is noted that the passage from earlier to later is associated with increasing entropy. The world gets more disordered, more untidy with increasing time. And this is illustrated by example of dropping an egg. If you filmed an egg falling to the ground and then smashing into pieces, you could tell whether the film was being played backwards or forwards. Messes happen, the world gets increasingly untidy. Messes do not unhappen, they do not tidy themselves up. But this again only serves to illustrate the circularity in the characterization of time. The observation that the universe is more disordered, has greater entropy at a later time than at an earlier time, presupposes that we already have in place the notions of later and earlier. Millions of words spent on time's arrow could have been saved had that obvious fact been noted. I think it may be clear to you now that time seems to resist being reduced to anything else. But I mention all these failed attempts to capture the essence of time to persuade you that any attempt to define time in non-temporal terms and in a non-circular way, will be doomed. This is expressed by the philosopher Quentin Smith. Time is neither causation, motion, physicality, mentality, or anything else. Time is time. Time is a series of items related by primitive and irreducible relations of earlier, later, and simultaneous. It may not be possible to define time other than by saying in all sorts of elaborate ways that time is time. Now you might think this is not a conclusion worth paying for good money to hear, but to reaffirm that time cannot be reduced to anything else is a way of affirming its irreducible reality. And this is something that many physicists and some philosophers have difficulty with. Indeed, some of them think they can do without time in developing a theory of everything because time boils down to something else. Arguing that time is irreducible to other things and cannot be dispensed with in any theory of the universe that is worth having, is itself a conclusion worth having. But it does leave plenty of work to be done, some of it characterised by the philosopher Craig Callender. In philosophy, he said, time has always been an especially challenging topic, you bet. At root, the problem is the quintessential difficulty that so often motivates philosophical discussion, the problem of disentangling the nature of the entity from the features we happen to attribute to it. So even if we cannot say what time is, other than that it is irreducibly itself, there is serious work to be done in saying what it is not and scraping off the metaphorical accretions that have gathered round our idea of time. The most potent of these metaphors for time comes from physics, and it is to describe it as a dimension, more specifically the one you'll be familiar with, time as the fourth dimension. 
So this brings us squarely back to physics and its failure to do justice to time. Seeing time as the fourth dimension is central to the physics of time. The first three dimensions belong to space. The spatial dimensions are up, down, side to side, and front to back, X, Y, and Z. Time then becomes little t. This exposes it to all sorts of indignities that real stretches of time would not tolerate. It can be multiplied by itself, placed under space to get velocity, and even multiplied by the speed of light. Just imagine multiplying a night with a crying baby by itself, putting a bargain break weekend in Bruges under some spatial distance, or multiplying the duration of a medical career by the square root of minus one. Time, as the fourth dimension, is like d'Artagnan, added to the three musketeers. By joining the club, in which it is outnumbered by spatial dimensions, it becomes spatialized. It is, of course, represented spatially in graphs. Here it is the horizontal axis. And then, of course, the traditional ways of representing time tend to be spatial. Sands moving in a timer, shadows moving over the dial of a sundial, fingers moving over the face of a clock. It is a fundamental mistake to spatialize time because there are profound differences between space and time. Here are some of the differences that have been often invoked. Space, we're told, does not flow, while time does. Space does, space does not have a direction. It is, after all, the sum total of the possibility of directions, whilst time does. Space has three dimensions and time only one. And finally, we can travel in space, but not in time. In fact, the first two of these disanalogies are invalid. They are fake news. Time does not flow either, does not flow any more than space does. And I'll talk about that presently. And we've already disposed of the idea that time has a direction, of the arrow of time. But what are those other two differences? I've already mentioned that space has three dimensions and time has, or is, only one. Equally clear is that it's possible to travel in space, but not possible to travel in time. I can travel from Stockport to London when I fancy, and I can choose my here. I cannot travel to 2019, or indeed choose my now. I have no choice over my now being this evening, the 10th of April 2018. I can go to any here, but not to any now. However, the spatial representation of time seems to have had the effect of licensing the idea that time travel is possible. So where does the myth of time travel come from? And why is it so seductive? There is a famous defense of this idea in a passage with which many of you may be familiar from H.G. Wells. Clearly, the time traveller proceeded, any real body must have extension in four directions. You must have length, breadth, thickness, and duration. There are really four dimensions, three which we call the three planes, he means dimensions, of space, and a fourth, time. There's no difference between time and any of the three dimensions of space, except that our consciousness moves along it. There are, of course, entirely respectable modes of time travel. There is indeed a sense in which everything is travelled in time. This room today is in Tuesday the 10th of April. And tomorrow, if all goes well, it'll be upright in Wednesday the 11th of April. But strictly, this is a mere movement in time rather than travelling in time. Travelling is something voluntary. And I cannot stop movement in time. Less banal is the mental time travel afforded by memory, particularly episodic memories of past experiences or factual memories of the historical past. I can, as the saying goes, cast my mind back at will to today's delightful journey down to London, and I can be transported back to the Battle of Hastings by a racy account of what happened. Forward travel in time is more contentious, and forward mental travel in, tra travel in time is more contentious. I can anticipate what will happen next week, but since it has no obligation to happen, however eager my anticipation, my time travel into the future may turn out to be an internal affair of my consciousness. So the time travel I'm thinking of, which has launched a thousand spaceships, has been defined by the philosopher David Lewis. Time travel that involves a discrepancy between personal time and the world's time. Forward time travel will be, say, getting to next Wednesday, 
when so far as the rest of the world is concerned, it's still Tuesday. And all backward movement is genuine time travel, travel, since the world is moving forward in time. Travelling to last Wednesday or 1066 would amount to occupying a personal time that was at odds with the world's time. So why is time travel so beloved of science fiction writers? And that's why I hate science fiction, by the way. Fundamentally, it is because of something I've already referred to, a false analogy between space and time that deludes us into thinking that since time and space are both dimensions, and since we can travel in space, we should also be able to travel in time. If I can go back and forth along a spatial line, why can't I go back and forth along a temporal line? Well, the answer is that time is not a line, though it is usually represented as such, misleadingly in natural science. But I owe you more of an explanation of the impossibility of time travel than that. Let me divide my critique of the very idea of time travel into three parts. The troubled journey, the difficult arrival, and finally the necessary impotence of the time traveller on arrival. I'm going, I'm, for simplicity, I'm going to confine myself to travel into the past. Travel into the future has an even, even more problems. So first, the troubled journey. Time travel requires the complete separation of movement in time from movement in space in a manner that is at odds with the mandatory four-dimensionality of movement as it is understood in common sense as well as in classic physics. When I move to the left, I move in time and in space. The time traveller has to engage in a one-dimensional movement of a four-dimensional person, reducing a journey to the equivalent of a pure line, essential, essentially to the mathematical representation of one of its dimensions. Now this may seem a bit tricky, but it's only the beginning of the contradictions built into time travel. The most important is the time traveller's need first to break with and then to reassume causal connections with the rest of the universe. So long as she is travelling, she has to be causally insulated from the rest of the universe as her movement is in the opposite direction to causation, for causation goes from prior cause to subsequent effect. In short, causal connectedness requires to be picked, it's required to be picked up and put down at will. And this itself without the assistance of causation. A part of the universe, the time traveller, her vehicle and any companions or luggage she brings with her has to break rank with the ranks with the rest of the universe without this impacting on anything else that is not there for the ride. So much for the journey. What about arrival at the target? The difficulties experienced by the time traveller in the departure hall and en route as nothing or as nothing to those that attend trying to arrive at a particular target date. How does one arrive at a date without any particular arrival at a point in space? Let's assume that our time traveller is able to land at a particular time, but this will be landing nowhere in particular, at no point in space, and in an infinitely t thin time slice. What happens when she leaves the time ship? More problems arise. There are obvious limitations on what she could be permitted to do. And this is connected with the best known objection to time travel. So supposing the space traveller returns to the day when her parents first met. She distracts one of them. As a result, they don't catch sight of each other and the relationship never happens. Consequently, our time traveller is not born. So she cannot undertake the journey we're now talking about. This is an example of how, by interfering with her past, she's or indeed the past of the universe, she's removed the very condition necessary for her journey to the past, namely that she should exist. There are clearly things she must be prevented from doing, such as distracting her parents. But since, however, every event has the capacity to deflect the subsequent course of the universe, however slightly, remember the butterfly effect, there appears to be no way of defining and vetoing those events that should be forbidden on the grounds that they will interfere with the time traveller being born, or even with the life that led up to her wanting to become a time traveller. So to be entirely safe, she should be forbidden to act at all because there cannot be bespoke or local tinkering, the butterfly effect. For the idea that there might be such local intervention 
that stays local flies in the face of the fact of the connectedness of the world. But even if she was granted a limited visa or limited causation permit, restricting all interference with the way things are at the destination, this wouldn't be enough to ward off problems. The very fact of her arrival, in virtue of eating, walking, breathing, or even looking, must alter what happens at her destination. Not only is she bound and forced to be impotent, she must forgo the hope of righting past wrongs, a common motive for fictional travellers, but she must be forbidden to do all the ordinary things which are necessary for survival. The causal chains set running by her lightest footfall would already be beyond her capacity to cancel. Footprints and eye prints are equally inadmissible. And in short, the time traveller is forbidden from doing anything on arrival, including breathing, that would constitute actual arriving. So much for time travel. As I said, its ubiquity in the genre is one of the many reasons why I can't stand science fiction. But that is another story. So we cannot travel in time, except in the rather ordinary sense of passing from Tuesday to Wednesday in 24 hour period. Does that mean that time itself travels? What are we to make of the idea that time flows? This seems a common sense observation. Of course time flows. Sometimes it rushes by when you're having a great time, and sometimes it crawls when you're bored, in pain, impatient, or listen to the le this lecture. But except metaphorically, the idea of time flowing is nonsense. If time really flowed, we would be justified in acting, asking what it flowed in. Clearly not space. Moments do not, for example, travel from Stockport to London. So does time flow in time? Or does it flow in some second order or hyper time? Something to which we can give no meaning? Clearly not. And anyway, if it did flow, how fast would it flow? One second per second? This manifestly makes no sense because you cannot have something happening at a certain rate if time is both on the numerator and the denominator. The point is that if time really were a dimension like length, it wouldn't flow any more than length flows in space. We think of time flowing only because we import into our idea of time our sense of the dynamism of the world, of the endless flight of events and of the movements that comprise them. Colloquially, we talk about the days passing, about Christmas coming near, near and about the years flashing by. What pass and what flash are events and our lives, not time. There are other images of the dynamism of time. Philosophers entertain the idea of the present being like a moving spotlight, lighting up, lighting up a succession of moments, making them be now. The philosopher C.D. Broad likened the passage of time to a policeman on patrol walking down a row of houses, illuminating them in succession with his bull's-eye torch. And there is the notion that time is a growing block as the sum total of days and the events they have witnessed get larger. These metaphors are all fluid, flawed. We think of time as dynamic or growing only because we project the restlessness of the universe and the expansion of the universe over time into time itself, which is then seen as carrying events from the future to the present and then into an ever-receding past. Now my focus has been on the way physics, if taken to be a full account of everything, would misrepresent time. In fact, it's been pointed out by some philosophers of physics that at a fundamental level, physics can do without time. Time is not fundamental, they say. It's certainly true of certain interpretations of quantum mechanics. As Lee Molin, Smolin has pointed out, the whole history of physics has been a history of diminishing the nature of time and diminishing the role of time. And this is not only bad for time, but bad for physics. Smolin says that cosmology is presently in crisis and the essence of this crisis is in the understanding of the nature of time. On this, I am most certainly not qualified to comment, but the problem goes beyond physics. Hermann Weyl famously declared that in the four-dimensional manifold of the Einstein universe, where time is spatialized, the objective world simply is. It does not happen. Only to the gaze of my consciousness, he says. Where on earth that comes from is unclear. Only to the gaze of my consciousness, crawling upwards along the lifeline of my body, does a section of this world come to life as a fleeting image in space, which continually changes in time. Given that many people of a physicalist persuasion believe that consciousness 
is in fact a property of the brain, this becomes very difficult to understand. But you can see now why I've been so keen to rescue time from the jaws of physics. Well, these are a few randomly chosen topics of the many that are discussed in a book that I've been a, been a decade in the making. There's much more I could say, but as Humphrey, Humphrey Littleton used to say, I can hear the tortoise of time exploding in the microwave of eternity. So it's time for you to have your say, and thank you for your attention, or at least for the courtesy of simulating it. Thank you. Thank you.